Hello fellow sim racers. Today I'm going to be talking to Leon Sudfeld, creator of the Sveg mod for Assetto Corsa and owner of the sim channel on YouTube. We're going to be discussing some of the ins and outs of creating a mod track from scratch in Assetto Corsa and hopefully, hopefully, giving a little bit of an insight into what goes into creating a project like Sveg. Hey Leon, how's it going man? Hi, I'm fine, how are you? Yeah, good, thank you. So I'm just going to get straight into the questions here. So could you give us a bit of context? Uh, what drove you to start creating Assetto Corsa mods and I guess specifically why this particular project? Right, so first of all, this is my only project so far. I'm very much a one-trick pony. And um, there were a couple of things that came together when I started this project. First of all, I've always had some opinions on what makes a good racetrack or what makes racetracks that I personally like. Um, and then at the time, I mean, I started this back in, I think, 2014, early 2014, something like that. Um, there weren't all that many racetracks out for a set of courses that I personally liked. I mean, um, I had my issues with Spa at the time, because without a direct drive wheel, there's or Rouge, and that will either you have your force feedback at very low um, um, <laughs> gain, or you're gonna have massive clipping in Arush. And I didn't even like Spa. So I like just like three, four tracks in a set of course of the main game and everything else, like in terms of moddings, I think there were the first little skid tracks maybe out, but there was just one or two. Um, and altogether, there wasn't a lot that I liked. So um, that and Personally, just a personal thing, I see myself as very much of a creator, so I like to create things in whatever I do, if it's programming, if it's making music, whatever I, I like to create. So these three things came together and basically um, led to me starting my own mod project. Um, about Zweig in particular, um, I was there on holiday in 2013 and I was taking some uh, landscape pictures and uh, also that picture that we saw in your other video on the racetrack. Um, which I then uh, showed to other track modders, which were active at the time, and asked them, okay, don't you want to include this scene maybe in your racetrack? And nobody would really go for it, uh, with one sort of little exception. Um, and in the end, I decided, okay, well, then I'm just going to go uh, go for it and try and see if I can build a racetrack basically around this, this scene. Um, the one little exception that I mentioned earlier was uh, Lucas, or Extreme Psionic, uh, who made Lake Louise. Um, he he started out this project with me or we we uh, teamed up we set up a little forum um and um uh, you, you actually see the bridge from Svig on lake louise at some point it's it's on the track um i don't know where exactly because it's really long but <laughs> yeah um right so th that's how i got started with this project and now about i guess 2000 hours later i'm sitting here giving this interview <laughs> with you Cool, man. So I guess what everyone wants to know is what is it that really goes into making an Assetto Corsa track? I think we've all seen track builder type projects that maybe don't work very well uh, and maybe thought, well, maybe I could have a go at it. So could you give us a bit of an overview about some of the areas involved in creating a circuit mod for Assetto Corsa? Right. So there's, there's a couple of um, distinct things that you um, need to work on uh, when making such a racetrack. So um, the most obvious part is the visuals, and that would include the 3D modeling, um, the texturing, and the shader setup. Um, and then there's the physics that would include the um, the road mesh, uh, most importantly. Um, the road mesh that you drive on, the physical mesh, it's actually a separate mesh from the visual mesh. So it's very high, very highly detailed, um, high poly count in the physical mesh. Um, that would just be wasted polygons and, and wasted resources if you would put that into the visual mesh. So that goes separate. And then you would also um, have every uh, wall in a separate um, in that case, lower detail than the um, than the visual walls, uh, probably. Um, so you have two. You have a different. You have two files. You have a physical file and you have a visual file, basically. So you're saying the, uh, just just to stop you there. You're saying the yeah. actual physical road mesh is uh, has more data in it than the visible one. That, that's kind of cool. Yes, like tenfold or even more. So oh, really? the wow. the visual mesh is very coarse and it's just. 
um, it, it's very few polygons um, in comparison to the like um, the physical road mesh. I would say has has polygons probably of, of this size, maybe in, in many places, maybe like so. But um, the the visual one um, has like uh, it would stretch basically <laughs> wow. all over the screen. I don't know. Um, so the the polygons are very large in the visual and very small in the physical. Um, mesh and yeah um right so we got visuals physics then there's a little bit of audio but that's not really that much because it's not very sophisticated in ac at least um you can add reverb in certain areas reverb but it's not really yeah, yeah I mean, you can hear that going can under, that. under bridges and close to some walls and stuff in some tracks can't you where the, right, all of a sudden right. this massive amount of reverb comes in from as if from nowhere yeah, I mean it, it works for places like in Barcelona with a with a grandstand that would, in reality, I guess, give you like a lot of reverb back on the track. Um, but I was, in particular with Swig, I was I was looking for a reverb that would kind of fit the section where you go over the lake, um, and there was just nothing that I could set up that that would produce a realistic sound of going over a lake because there's basically just a flat surface to both sides with no walls or anything. Um, and then also I didn't find anything that would sort of mute everything up a little like when you go into a forest where you have the, the um, um, trees basically muting the sound completely. But yeah, couldn't really do that because AC. <laughs> um, right. And uh, then there's uh, functionality that goes into it. That's, um, for example, the starting positions for the grid. So where exactly the, the cars are placed in the grid. Same for the pit boxes. There's um, the timekeeping, so the start-finish line and the sector splits. Um, then there's um, the you need to define what counts as track, what counts as counts as off track, what's the pit lane. Um, there's start lights, and of course um, the AI line is also um, something that I would put in the functionality. Yeah, maybe we can um, uh, circle here. back to the AI thing later because I think that's that's quite an interesting subject. That uh, okay, yeah. maybe it's maybe it's beyond the scope of this, but um, it's something that really interests me anyway. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I think you've answered that that quite well. There oh. is one thing that <laughs> sort of uh, maybe what uh, actually. Wasn't included. <laughs> oh, go on. Yeah, one, one thing that I still have uh, in my notes here that, that I so far didn't mention, um, the architecture and the planning that oh, goes yeah. into it. And that's that's specific for fantasy tracks, I guess. On a, if, if you're recreating a real world track, then um, you, you have an easier job in this regard. Um, you don't need to come up with uh, the architecture of the buildings and bridges, um, and you don't need to to plan the circuit layout or anything, right? So um, that's, I think, the, the most important part that sets Svig and other fantasy tracks apart from um, railroad tracks. And I guess that's also the, the um, part where um, many projects go a little bit down the drain, um, <laughs> be becoming unrealistic by just, you know, stitching famous corners together from other tracks or just going through, like, going for crazy stuff. And um, I, yeah, I very much try to to, to keep away from, from doing anything too crazy. And I was very much approaching this, this project uh, with the intention of creating something that could be uh, viewed as realistic. And then there goes a lot of planning in that. Like, you need to think of, okay, how, how is my... Um, um, pit road gonna look like how wide is it how wh what's in there how does the pit building look is it realistic to have like a, a silver stone like huge pit building in a remote location such as Svig where there's obviously not going to be any formula one uh, <laughs> going on right so um stuff like that and then um um, also, like, okay, you need martial outposts, right? You need um, track infrastructure, like, because the marshals will have to get to their outposts, right? So you need to have some sort of walkways that, that go through the landscape. Um, then in some places, you need tunnels under the track, and you need track exits for crash cars. Um, you need to think about runoff areas and uh, tire walls and or armco uh, barriers. And... You know all that kind of stuff, and there, so there's, there's a lot there's of quite a lot architecture of, um, going on, going uh, into it. Quite a lot, yeah. You're, I think you put it 
uh, very well though he said there's actually a, a huge amount of being a planner and an architect before you even get down to you know making it functional or look good or anything like that so i think you sort of actually yeah. answered my next question which was going to be sort of what uh, were you able to incorporate any real world data and things uh, like that into this obviously you uh, you said you'd uh, traveled there in 2013 so presumably you took mm -hmm. reference photos and things like that was, was there anything well back then sort of actually that helped informed because it? Uh, when I was there in 2013, I, I had no intention of making a mod track. So I was just, <laughs> you know, being a photographer, um, I was just um, looking for a nice location to take pictures and um, came across that, that bridge that goes across the lake there. Um, and um, I actually had to use um, Google Street View for reference uh, for, for like quite a lot of time. Um, but I did go back there actually now for this mod track in uh, 2017. So I drove up there in my summer holiday um, to take reference pictures as well as some um, texture pictures. And I guess we, we can talk about that when we talk about textures. Yeah, but, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll um, back to textures. But um, I, I did go back to take more reference pictures. Other than that, it was um, there wasn't a lot of um, data to to work with, unfortunately, because the um, um, the Google maps or google earth height profile of the area is, is not really usable there was like a 10 meter drop within the lake surface or something <laughs> um so that doesn't make a lot of sense right i couldn't really use the data so um yeah i had to go off of my memory and uh photos photo reference and um yeah of course the the accuracy of the of the landscape is probably not as high as it could be with a with any sort of laser scan or better satellite height profile data but yeah but that being it said is what only, it is. only part of the track is using uh actual roadway there so uh i i guess limited uh value to a sim racer would be added by having a laser scan of the area i think that'd be mo right. mostly I mean, for your own interest really <laughs> sure yeah i mean so the, you have this uphill straight after the after the bridge that this whole track is based around basically right um and I'm not sure if I'm if I'm nailing the right height uh, where it goes into the uh, next right turn after the uphill straight. Um, it, maybe the, the the way it bends up is a little off. I don't know. Um, it, it's hard to tell off of pictures alone. So a laser scan would have helped a little. Um, but yeah, satellite height information would probably be the the thing I could really use, but didn't manage to get any so far. So yeah, it is what it is. I think I, I mentioned in in my video review of Seg that this is fantasy tracks aren't really my thing. Uh, I my interest mm -hmm. in sim racing has come from the fact that I'm interested in real world motorsports. So I was actually really surprised by well two things. One, how much I actually really enjoyed driving it, and I think that's testament to sort of the approach you've taken to making it plausible but also how much it sort of reminded me and i'm going off the prepared questions here how much it reminded me of um just some of the tracks or so just the vibe of some of the tracks in those early gran turismo games because i think those were uh I, I hope you see that as a compliment rather than anything else but i, I think those were I, sort I of some of the few i'll tell you why i laugh in a second <laughs> those are some of the few <laughs> fancy tracks i've ever driven that I thought were approached with a kind of a care and attention and I guess those early Gran Turismo games really hung on the quality of those fantasy tracks as well before they started to bring more real world stuff into it. I perfectly agree and um, so one of my favorite tracks of all time um, and definitely my favorite fantasy track I guess would be Deep Forest Raceway yeah. from Gran Turismo 3 uh, I guess um, and actually it did inspire well one corner um, <laughs> to, to some degree um, and um, yeah so I, I didn't completely dismiss any knowledge of other tracks that I had before so I didn't want to stitch together just famous corners from other tracks um, but I was inspired by a couple of things that I that I like in a couple of tracks that I like in particular so Deep Forest Raceway um, as unrealistic as it may be uh, in, in today's standards, um, the, the circuit layout itself, I think, is, is pretty nice and um, it's a pretty fun track. I would actually love to have that in a set of courses, <laughs> yeah. but um, yeah. uh, so far uh, there, there's only been one, um, well, very, um, let's say, 
medium quality uh, <laughs> version of Trial, Trial Mountain. Um, mm -hmm. And no Deep Forest Raceway so far, um, as far as I know. So, um, yeah, but that was that was inspiring. Um, and then, but I think that's the only fantasy track that that inspired me um, with the with this layout. And other than that, it was more tracks like Albert Park in Melbourne. Um, it was, uh, I, I guess, Mossport um, a little bit, and some it does some have of a the Mossport US based vibe, tracks. Yeah, Mossport vibe, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, sure. uh, I thought that the first time I drove it. It's got a weirdly. It feel. I think I said in the video again. Apologies if I'm. Uh, repeating yeah. myself it feels very scandinavian but it does have a north american kind of vibe about it at times as well yeah so. <laughs> and i i agree and that's i mean that's not really an accident um <laughs> i do enjoy uh, many of the north american uh tracks i'm a like probably one of my favorite racetracks in the world overall would be road atlanta which did not inspire any turns in particular but um it is an example of a north american racetrack right and then um there is there's um mossport and just a couple of others that i think don't get enough recognition in the world of motorsports and sim racing and and should be um like we we always see those those um european tracks popping up in every sim ever and then there's so many gems really in north america that are usually overlooked, unfortunately. Yeah, apparently you have to have a version of Imola in every racing game uh, ever. Yes. Otherwise, you can't release it. So. And Silverstone and <laughs> oh, and the Nurburgring GP track. It's okay. I, I, I'm British. I'm allowed to rag on Silverstone. It's awful. <laughs> 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 anyway, let, let's move on. Um, mm -hmm. You said uh, I seem to remember when we were talking uh, before I took a look at the Sveg mod uh, that you actually took up learning 3d modeling for the project so what does that process mm -hmm. entail how do you go from not knowing any 3d modeling to producing some of the quite complex assets that you need for an assetto corsa mod um right so that's it's a big process and to to anybody starting or getting into modding i would probably suggest today to just start off with something small and start off with maybe um a tutorial that that teaches you to learn um, 3D modeling in like from from the ground up and and teaches you the basics, um, but that's not what I did. I <laughs> very much approached this um, without much. Um, yeah, I didn't think about it too much. I didn't plan how I would go about learning the whole thing. I was just I just wanted to get into it and just get on with it and start. Um, so um, I got most of my knowledge off of individual um, YouTube tutorials and of course a lot of um, the the stuff that's being posted on the uh, race department forums and um, back in the day it was the Assetto Corsa mod forum that has been closed unfortunately um, after a while um, and um, basically I took it piece by piece so first figured out how to do the um, to do the, the layout like okay how do I now put a spline down and how do I make that spline into a road um, at least like with a 2d um, wraparound thing um, and um, well then you go on and then you start you figure out okay you need to have some land that goes around it so you start um, learning how to sculpture the landscape and then at some point you need to learn uv mapping or texture mapping um, and all those it all came piece by piece for me um and um looking back i would have preferred to have it to have learned it in a more structured way um but yeah um that that's not how it turned out for me one thing that was very helpful was that um, lucas and i set up this this farm that i mentioned earlier where we um, collected um, tutorials and how to's and our own experience on um, how to solve certain uh, things that we needed to include in our tracks, so Lake Louise and Zweig. Um And um, yeah, we, we helped each other out. So uh, I think the the community aspect already in this in the early stage with basically just Lucas um, uh, was very helpful to have someone to talk to and who's trying to figure out the, the same problems at the same time. 
Cool, man. Uh, and you're using you're using Blender, aren't you? Uh, which I understand. Uh, I'm is, using Blender. Yeah, that's yes. that's still free, isn't it? Uh, open source. It's open source? it's still free, and I think it's yeah. it's going to remain free. Yeah. Um, I don't. I mean, it's it's a collaborative project. I think that um, that has many contributors. Um, uh, with no plan of ever commercializing it, um, at least I hope so. Um, <laughs> and um, the, the reason I chose it was not necessarily because it's free, but because I would find tutorials on it more than on any, any other um, uh, modeling software. So um, being a university student, I would have had access for relatively low prices to even zero in some cases to the uh, commercial modeling software. But I didn't find, and I actually at, at one point I tried getting into it with Cinema 4D, um, but I didn't find the tutorials that I needed to create a track. So I switched to Blender, and um, it, it's I, I'm not particularly fond of Blender. At least anything before version 2.8, I think, um, has severe usability issues um, that you really need to wrap your head around. Um, but it's what the what the uh, tutorials were made for. So um, basically, I had to live with it and had to <laughs> wrap my head around it. Uh, such is life. So once you've got uh, this uh, 3D model, presumably the next step is um, starting to produce textures. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing here because my modeling knowledge is, is, <laughs> is very low. But um, you mentioned earlier that you actually took photographs yourself as references for textures. Is, it, is that where you start with this sort of thing or do you try... Well, how about I don't try and pre preempt the question and I let you just talk <laughs> about the process of creating textures. All right. Um, so. Uh, first off, um, you don't necessarily um, start out with a 3D model and then wrap your texture on it, but at least the, the planning of any object, I guess, um, should be, uh, you, should, you should plan to, like, how your texture will look roughly uh, and how the model will look. Um, and you can, you can approach it either way, so you can start out with a, with a texture, if it's, at least if it's a simple object. Um, you can start out um, with with a texture if you know what, what goes into it, and then um, make the model, then map the texture onto the three D model, uh, or you can approach it the other way. Um, uh, but when you do the model, the three D model, you should already have an idea of how um, uh, the texture mapping works. Otherwise, um, you'll just do things that you will later regret and then you will have to do it all over, which I had to do so many times um, <laughs> because I had no idea how all of this works in the beginning. Um, but yeah, by now I think I I sort of figured out how to do modeling, 3D modeling and, and texture work. So about the textures, um, first of all, you need a, a tool for that as well. So we had Blender for the 3D modeling and uh, my tool of choice for making textures would be traditional Photoshop. Um, it, it's not a must to have, and, and I know that Photoshop is quite expensive at, at least here. I'm paying 12 euros a month, so it's oh, like wow. I wish uh, I was 144 paying euros for, per uh, year. I wish I was paying that little for a creative suite. Wow. <laughs> yeah, okay, the, the creative suite is, is like, uh, I guess, 40 euros around that, 40, 50 even. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. It depends on, on like how much you want in it, but um, you, you can get the photographer's package with yeah. just Photoshop and Lightroom for 12 bucks a month. Um, and um, that, that's what I'm using. Um, I need it anyway for, for my photography. Um, but for example, I know that um, Lilsky is not using Photoshop. I think he's using like PaintShop Pro or something, and he's also producing very good textures. So it's not a must have uh, for me since, um, I'm very used to Photoshop, and I think I, I've used Photoshop ever since I was 12. Um, it, it was no question which software I'm going to use. Yeah. So, um, and then there is there are a couple of, of basic techniques that I think you need to know how to use uh, when you make textures, and that would be you need to know how to use um, layer masks um, because you're going to be blending uh, multiple te textures all the time um, and editing um, like maybe painting in some things into your textures and so on. So um, you need to know how to use the layer mask. You need to know how to use the different blend modes in Photoshop. At least it's very helpful to do that. Um, there's like um, 
linear adding of two structures basically or you can have multiplication negative multiplication all those blending modes that will only um make sense to, to people who already know photoshop <laughs> a little bit so i'm not going to go into too much detail here um and then in the end um it's very useful if you know how to make textures tileable because um a lot of times you will use something that needs to repeat over and over like the road surface for example it's just a stretch of a couple meters and that will repeat over and over and if you have like a visible visible uh, seam between the w w whenever it repeats uh that's no way it will just look bad so um knowing how to make any texture basically tileable um is also one of these basic skills that go into it and then to get more into the meat of what it actually looks like uh, when you create a texture is um I think most textures um, in current 3D games, um, or at least those that, that aim to look realistic, are based off of photos. So you start out with a photo of um, the thing you're trying to model, ideally. Um, taken to the, um, to the extreme, you would end up with photogrammetry, but that's a different topic, and I'm not using any of that in Sphere. Um, but you would start out with a, with a picture um, and then it depends very much on um, uh, what, what you're trying to do. So um, you take reference pictures um, and then you take real pictures that, that translate directly into the texture. And you just um, need to clean those up usually uh, to some extent um, because there will be like things that you take pictures of in the real world will be dirty, um, maybe in a way that, that you don't want it. Maybe it would mess up how it tiles and it would leave like weird um, visible repetitions, which you're also trying to avoid as much as possible. Um, so you're going to be doing some some uh, geometric corrections, um, of course, because you, you have to project it on a flat plane usually in, in your 3D model. And taking the picture, you can't always um, approach it from dead center um, and take the picture, but you're sometimes at an angle. So you need to correct that. And then you need to clean up the texture. Um, it, uh, maybe make it tileable, um, depending on, on what the object is and whether or not it repeats a lot. Um, and um, yeah, and then there is a lot of like tweaking contrasts and um, colors, I guess. Um, also, you want your, your track in the end to have like an overall um, just just colors that that fit well with each other. So yeah. if you're if one part of your grass has um, a distinct yellow ish um, flair to it or, or color cast to it, you don't want other grass like the 3D, uh, the, the 2D sprites of, of that make 3D grass on top of that. Um, you don't want that to be in a more bluish uh, color tint, right? So you want to um, really make everything match as as good as possible so that you have a coherent color mix in, in your final racetrack. That's that's one of the things I've actually um, uh, praised uh, tracks by people like Fat Alfie and uh, Lilski is they've managed to really mm -hmm. capture a really coherent uh, color palette and uh, color temperature that I think you have to maybe have a bit of a background in, in design or photography or, or video or something like that and uh, be used to those concepts to really understand. And I think that's uh, certainly one way with mods to be able to tell a level of sort of visual care that's been uh, sort of done with them. Uh, so, yeah, mm -hmm. it, it, and that comes across in Sveg as well, where there is a very sort of sensible, believable color palette. So, mm -hmm. Which is, by the way, going to change a little bit in the next version, but uh, <laughs> I guess we, we'll get to that later. Just, just a tiny bit, though. <laughs> cool. Right. So I think we've covered uh, textures pretty well there. Um, mm -hmm. So you've got your 3D model, you've got, textures on it it looks believable what about how do you, how does that then become uh, a game asset in assetto corsa and what about some of the technical stuff that can't be seen right um so once you have your your project done in in blender um you're gonna want it to get it into the game right so what blender will give you is an fbx file which is like a, a 3d file with the texture mappings um and it'll contain all the objects and so on but the the game can't make any sense of of a texture file like that uh sorry a fbx file like that so um you're gonna load this up into the ks editor which is provided by kunos it's actually a modding tool and that's the the part of the software 
that uses the Assetto Corsa engine and will let you set up the um, all your shaders um, to to look the way you want them to. Um, and um, it's also it will export a KN5 file. So KN5 is the is the format for all um, uh, Assetto Corsa 3D object related things. So. Uh, and that's what the game engine then can make sense of. Um, so you load your FBX files out of Blender into the KS editor, and then you set up the um, your your shaders. And that process in itself is also um, it, it takes a lot of time and a lot of fine tuning to to get all the brightness levels right. Um, and um, the the shader setup itself can be quite complicated. So for example, the um, typically, the, the road surface is not just one texture, but it's actually uh, it's one main texture um, that has, is a diffuse texture. So what you would think of a texture, usually you, you would think of the diffuse texture, which is the, the yeah, painted graphic. Um, and then you have a specular part um, that defines like how, um, which parts are how reflective, so you can have parts of the surface being more reflective than others. Um, so for example, if you have those little uh, bumps from the from the individual stones in the asphalt, you want the top of them to be reflective, but the, 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 the seams um, between the individual stones in the asphalt, they don't really reflect much light. So um, you want a specularity map that will just um, allow the sunlight to bounce off of the top of the stones, but not <laughs> from the seams. Um, and then there is lots of detailed textures. So as you move closer to the to the asphalt in the game, um, you will uh, have um, you, you'll see more and more of the detailed textures. And then you can blend them with various um, uh, masks again um, into one another. And all I'm trying to say is here: there's more in setting up the textures than just painting them in Photoshop um, or creating them in Photoshop in any way. Um, so that's also part, a part that still is between the Blender project and the game. Now, once we've sorted that out, there are still um, a lot of things that um, need to be taken care of about the racetrack in, in config files and, and other files um, that we so far haven't really talked about. That would be, um, for example, what we address the, the physical road surface, right? So the, that's nothing visual, but it's, it's a separate mesh and it's, it's purely physical. Um, and um, there's lots of functionality uh, things uh, also that, that I mentioned earlier that you need to put in the right places. Um, the AI line, as I said earlier, um, yeah, all these things need to come together um, to, in the end, form, uh, for, form what, what gives you your, your final um, product, the racetrack itself, that is drivable and, and workable with AI and in multiplayer and so on. Cool, man. Um, so a uh, bit of a curveball question that I just sort of thought up there. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that is difficult for me as someone who's an outsider, uh, an outsider is probably the wrong word, but someone who doesn't produce uh, mods for Assetto Corsa is sometimes I'll, I'll drive a mod and I think, you know, this, this feels pretty good. I like this. It looks good. And then uh, you'll get comments from the community and people that know what they're talking about. So uh, this is actually a bit rubbish. What what are some things to look out for in in an Assetto Corsa mod track that maybe highlight that it's not a particularly well put together mod? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> putting right. you on the spot, um, there, man. But. I think mostly when you have a track that wasn't that, that didn't receive the the proper amount of care by its creator, um, you will mostly you you won't often see it in in the big picture. I mean, sometimes it's obvious if if a track was built by. I don't know, Bob's racetrack builder or something. Um, but often it will be like just lots of details that you yourself as a track maker spend a lot of time fixing and that aren't fixed in in, in another track. And then you will notice um, some of these would, would include, for example, um, transitions between different surfaces. So um, maybe between the road and the grass next to it. Um, in reality, you always have some sort of a of a ledge uh, on the side of the uh, of the asphalt band, um, and then it'll be slightly higher. So you may have like a little shadow um, that that should go on the grass, and then often um, cars will just um, uh, yeah 
ever so slightly skim the grass on the side so that the, the grass won't be as, as dense and thick uh, right next to the road. So you'd have you would often have some sort of a transition that is visible. Um, and I think you, you would have a transition like that in, in most or all of the good um, mod tracks. Um, it's, it's not just between the road and the grass, but it's also between all sorts of um, uh, surfaces where you just have those little transitions um, uh, that, that get rid of the hard seams between one texture and another. Um, and um, then there is visible tiling. So um, uh, we, we could maybe put on the screen the, the picture of the cat here with vanilla versus <laughs> HD texture pack um, that, that I showed you before. Um, so in that picture, you see some visible tiling. And if you see anything like that in a, in a track, it's, um, it, it's probably a sign that maybe the creator should have taken a little more care in, in putting that in. Uh, and fixing the texture so that no distinctly um, notable detail will repeat over and over and over um, in the same fashion. So, um, yeah, those are things. And then there's floating objects and, and objects that just penetrate the ground a little too much for comfort. Um, and and just, yeah, all sorts of little details um, that if, if you look at the track, if you inspect it closely, that, that you will uh, notice once you've put your, your own time into fixing those on your own track. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's move Stand on from that because it's all too easy mm -hmm. to, to focus on negative stuff. And I'm sure we could I could come up with a whole bunch of examples where crazy stuff's happened in mod tracks, I've found. <laughs> but um, yeah. that does lead nicely on to talking about the community. And uh, something you were keen to express uh, when I first did the video for Sveg was that you'd had a lot of help from other members of the Assetto Corsa modern community and from the outside it does seem like a really great core group of guys that are instilling some pretty strong values and I think helping to drive the quality of mods forwards and upwards. Do you think that's a fair assessment of, of things? Yeah I think that that's actually a um, very fair assessment and um, I was I was just pretty lucky to to get in touch with the right people um, a little later in the development process only um, but um, those people have helped me tremendously. And um, for example, of course, I mean, most, uh, most prominently Lilski, um, who, who is one of the um, great figures in the AC modding world, I guess. Um, he's helped me a lot with, uh, with this racetrack. He's actually done the, um, the groove or the um, skid marks on track for Svig, and I'm still using his and I've, I've never touched them again so I'm, I'm um so he's he's part of <laughs> if you will he's part of the sphere team but um uh, just to, to a very small extent um but still and he's also helped me um like tremendously with blender and how to just achieve certain things and what add-ons to blender i should use and so on so he's been very helpful and um but there's there's a whole group of people um who have uh, helped me and supported me in creating this track um, and um, for example uh, one one more person to mention maybe is, is uh, Riegel from Italy um, who's um, uh, who's the donor for some of the track side objects that you see on Sveg so um, there's the marshals there's the tow truck um, the trucks and cars um, that that are in the paddock that come from him um, and uh, I think the tents in the paddock there are Lilskis, so uh, it's the same tents as on. on yeah, the, those tents tracks. do get around a little bit, don't yeah. they? <laughs> yeah, they, they do. And I mean, but but it's it's a good thing that that you have this community and and that this kind of sharing goes on, um, because there are just so many details. Like, try to try to model or model not so much, but try to texture a truck and try to find a texture for a truck. Um, you, you would have to go out and find a truck, take your, your own pictures. It would just be a lot of effort. And then you need uh, multiple cars just like for the parking lots yeah. that, that stand around the racetrack. Um, and you would have to take pictures of all of them and then cut them out and make a model and just somehow make it work. It's just so much effort because there's so many little objects and details that you will basically need for any racetrack that can look completely generic, but that sort of need to be there. Um, a famous example maybe is the is the ambulance car on any Kunos track 
that will be seen in so many places. I, I, I don't think there are so many ambulance cars on a real racetrack, <laughs> but they're reusing that asset over and over on all their tracks. Um, and in the same way, I think it makes it makes sense to to share some assets uh, in the community. Um, and and I'm very grateful that I um, that I was allowed to to use the tents and the the cars and trucks and marshals. Um, in particular, um, people are difficult to create because I mean, imagine what goes into creating a model of a person, right? If, if you just came up with it yourself, and you would first of all you would have to model the face, which is, um, if you don't know what you're doing, it's incredibly difficult. And it's just so you could have some marshal standing on the side of the track, right? Um, and you could spend days or weeks mo trying to model a marshal, and then it's just some guy on the side of the street. So it's very good to have those assets uh, around. And then, um, yeah, you can, I mean, th th there's other tools to, to get like humans. There's make human, which is a tool, but still the, the community aspect is really really helpful and um yeah um well i think the yeah, community guess, aspect of yeah. assetto corsa is assetto corsa now i mean you know kunos mm -hmm. um stopped developing it 18 months ago um for me uh there's more life in assetto corsa today than there was at the end of its development cycle because of the modding community uh certainly we've had mm -hmm. more great stuffs come out in the last 12 months than than in the preceding 12 so as, as someone who just sits and you know has made a small youtube career off of Assetto Corsa mods you know it just uh it's a fantastic resource so i'm glad there is this level of cooperation between everyone because it's it's great as an end user yeah yeah definitely um yeah i, I have nothing to add it's just completely <laughs> okay well yes. let's let's move on uh you mentioned earlier that uh you've got an update coming for sveg i think it's it'll be coming up to 1.2 now so maybe you can use this as an right. opportunity to tell everyone you know what's in store Right, uh, we're finally getting night racing uh, in Sweden. I mean, you, you could use, you could turn the lights off, uh, the sunlight that is um, previously, but um, the, the track would not really be, uh, there, there wouldn't be any lights and so on. So um, I've spent a lot of time now adding proper lighting. Um, nice. And by the time this video comes out, I guess um, the track should be out as well, or roughly in the same, um, in the same period of time. So um, expect Sveg 1.2 to be out right about now or within <laughs> the next few days at the latest. Um, it'll feature some lights for night racing. Um, it'll feature some distinct, um, um, yeah, uh, fixes on the track or little things that, that I've felt make the track just a little bit better for example I, I extended the curbs a little or i put some some stones into the grass um next to the curb in turns uh six and seven which just um allow for you to just run off the track a little more and make those turns feel less annoying i guess um and it's i think it's places where i personally ran off all the time so that that's why i figured okay in a real racetrack when you have a, a place where people run off all the time um then you're gonna um put something in to reinforce the the grass and the the, the structure of the ground basically um because otherwise you're just going to be digging holes with the cars right and um Examples of that would be, I guess, um, in Brands Hatch, you have those a lot where yeah, you have, yeah. um, uh, which turn is it? One, two, like exit of turn three, the left, left hand turn there, um, where basically everybody goes off track with four wheels, um, just riding on, on the stones in the grass. Um, yeah, these things are, are added in um, turns. Uh, six that's right before the the long uphill straight and before the second bridge and turn seven which is um the right hand turn after um the uphill bridge uh, uphill straight yeah um then the the corner where everybody crashes all the time also got a little bit of this these stones set into the grass uh, as well and that would be turn um 10. it's like sort of a two apex left hand, left -hand turn yeah, yeah. um and 
I know that everybody crashes that turn because it's it's blind uh, in a way, and you don't know what you're breaking for. But uh, it's one of the more difficult turns, I guess, on the track, yeah. and that that's also being just made a little easier with those extra strips of, of uh, concrete in the ground. In the ground, you know, everyone's going to be in the comments saying, "Oh, you just have grass run off. Stop, stop tarmacking over all the grass." <laughs> um i actually um i gravel traps that's I, what I, I have a <laughs> i have a i have opinions on on like runoff areas very much and i try to implement what what i think uh, would be a solution to um to also many um uh what do you call it? track limit violations mm. in, in formula one um and I could I could rant on that topic for hours probably, but the the solution in my eyes is to put a strip of grass before the asphalt, and that's what I did in Sveg, um, just to give it um, this incentive of running wide there, because when you go on the grass with ever so slightly with the outside bit of your of your tires, um, you'll just lose a very little small amount of time, right? And when you go on the grass a little more, you lose more time, and it's a gradual thing, um, centimeter by centimeter, as you as you push wider and wider, um, and it, it usually it does not give you any time, or it doesn't provide you with a better lap time if you go wider and wider once you're once you're touching the grass. So, um, in my opinion, just drawing a line there and saying, well, but you can't go over this line with more than two wheels. Um, that's that's not a good solution because the the best and the quickest line to to go around the racetrack will be to put the inside two wheels, if you will, exactly next to that line, so that one centimeter further and you would be disqualified. I think but there's a there's the, a good the example way. of this on the um, Assetto Corsa version of Imola where uh, whatever the chicane at the top of the hill is the concrete area on the right hand side of the track there is made of some sort of ice Vaseline oil blend has oh, no yeah, grip that's... whatsoever so you put a tyre even slightly on it and, and, and it ruins yeah. your lap time or you spin or whatever uh, so everyone stays in the track limits there so I th- yeah I agree I think you're absolutely right. Exactly I, I would put grass instead of this weirdly <laughs> low grip surface whatever it is um, because grass, I think it looks better and it's more natural. But yeah, um, stuff like that r- really helps. It's just to to avoid having this issue where the best possible line is right next, the centimeter next to a line that will get you disqualified. And that's that's I think the issue, and that's what's forcing the drivers to go as close as they can to the to the limit. Um, but then if if they overstep it by one centimeter, it's not like a minimal loss in lap time because they they touch the grass ever so slightly. But instead, it's a disqualification, and, and that's something that that is inherently wrong with this idea of just having a parking lot with lines on it be the racetrack instead of uh, having something surrounded by by grass, right? Um, right. Uh, anyway, we, we got off track a little <laughs> bit here. I was still talking about um, the changes for Svag 1.2. Um, so we have these these extensions that I think um, are are nice to have on the track. And actually, um, I need to uh, switch on the power here, otherwise my laptop is going out. Of- <laughs> so we have these natural extensions um, th- th- that basically I think would also appear on a real racetrack after a while. So it's it's kind of cool to have um, uh, to update Svig and just put in things that. And have the track develop in a way that also maybe a real racetrack would develop. Yeah, um, it's just out of experience because when you first build the track, and of course you're going to drive it a lot, but you still don't know how where people are going to run off most, and and um, you don't you don't test it with all the possible cars and so on. And after a while and driving it more and more, you develop a feeling for where um, any real racetrack would be improved, maybe. And uh, the same is true here for a sweet. Um and then one thing in particular um, that I personally um, like very much in the newest version is um, that I'm sticking a little closer to um, reality and I'm trying to reinforce this theme of having it um, be a non-permanent racetrack. Um, the the asphalt of the rural roads in Sweden actually is often, it has, at least in, in the Sveg area, um, it has some distinct red stones in it and um i I can we can probably pop up a um 
picture, uh, a photo that I took um, right at, at one part of the racetrack that basically exists in, in reality, um, uh, we, we see that uh, one road is very much red in color and, then, and that, that's part of the track and I'm also putting that red color. Um, I've put that into the racetrack now so you will have more of a resemblance with a real world location. Um, and that also goes for the for the road markings, the white paint and the the uh, lane divider strips um, that you will now see um, after between turn two and turn three, so um, all the way across the first bridge, um, and then after turn seven again, where the red patch of asphalt comes in. Um, so, so yeah, they will fair, make a fair to say distinct that, visual difference. Um, it would be fair to say that this is still. Uh, work in progress is probably the wrong word, but still a labor of love. You're finding ways you can improve it and you want to make Sveg the best possible uh, version of uh, an Assetto Corsa mod that you yes. can. Yes, of course. I mean, um, as I said in the beginning, I'm, I'm very much a one-trick pony. I, it's my only mod track. It's the only project. If, if I have an idea or, or if I just want to relax and, and do some uh, modeling work, um, that's that's what I turn to um, because there is nothing else for me to do, um, and, and I'm not at a point where I want to start another project right now. So um, I'd rather improve Sphere than than start a whole new project that I know is going to take me a thousand hours to complete. Um, so uh, yeah, but by now, like with a 1.2 update, it may be the last update. I don't know. Maybe there will be like smaller updates after that, but um, I. I think it, it's getting to a point where everything that I uh, wanted to put in or anything that I could up, could come up with that, that makes sense as a feature or as a visual detail to the track is already in. Um, of course, there are like minor things that I still have in the back of my head, but um, mostly I, I would consider it done with this update. But then again, I've said that probably about 1.0 <laughs> and 1.1 as well. So um, yeah, but I don't know. I don't know. But yes. I'm, I'm going to be very never happy. Finished, are they? No. Um, and again, I guess on the subject of um, other projects and things like that, I, I guess it would segue really nicely to mention the fact that you've also got a YouTube channel. So maybe you mm -hmm. could use this as an opportunity to give a, a bit of a plug, tell the viewers uh, what sort of content you make and why they should uh, give you a subscribe. Right. So actually, my YouTube channel is. is I think not all that different from from yours, except that maybe I have a little bit more of a hardware focus uh, in in my channel. Uh, I haven't done a lot of software stuff outside of Sveix so far, but um, so I'm doing mostly. Uh, I'm trying to produce like high quality um, hardware review videos and then just opinions and um, stuff like that on basically what what you see behind me here, my rig. Um, my my wheelbase, my pedals, my my wheel rims, um, and or, or maybe the the seat. Um, video on that. Let me just roll back into the frame here. Um, <laughs> so, um, and then I do voiceovers, uh, very much like you, I guess, in in your um, hardware videos. Um, yeah, I'm letting and, you have a plug um, basically because I, I I appreciate the videos you make and uh, particularly yeah. the hardware stuff's really good. I really enjoyed the the so, Hasselveld, uh, pedal review recently, which I think I shared on the channel anyway. But if you haven't gone and watched it, mm -hmm. you should because it's a really well made video. Yeah, right. I guess so. So there's the hardware reviews. There's some some bits of of uh, Sveig, um behind the scenes stuff and so on, um, and then there's the occasional stream. Um, I did one when I had the the Fnatic DD1 new, um, or two streams actually, and and I might do some more in the future, but we'll see about that. So I guess the highlight so far in my channel would be uh, probably the the Hoisingfeld uh, factory tour that I did. So I actually oh God, uh, yeah, went that, there. That was that was a couple of years ago, now, and, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was I think late 2016. Yeah, 2017. good good on that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it, it was very interesting, and they, they were very kind to just let me um, drive over. I mean, it's it's like a two-hour ride from where I live, so it's not too far. But it was it was very kind of them to just um, um, yeah let me visit them, take some time out of their workday um, to shoot a little bit of a video um, to to show the world basically where those where and how those yeah. those pedals are made. Um, I think that was very interesting, and it was um, it was very much exceeding my expectations. They also have their own simulator room up there, where they actually left me alone to just drive for however <laughs> long I, I 
won it. So um, they had the they had two guys left downstairs um, who who were responsible for uh, assembling pedals. But I had the whole I was alone in the in the upstairs um, department. I was I was pretty surprised. They were very um, very trusting and um <laughs> of course rightfully so in my case um i didn't do anything i shouldn't do but i, I was very happy and and um yeah those are just a bunch of great people and um i'm very happy that they uh, are as successful with their pedals and other hardware that as they are right now so that that would be one one highlight um yeah i'll channel. make sure i um, uh, make sure i put a link up in the um uh, the top right yeah. corner if i remember when i edit this video because it is a genuinely <laughs> yeah. really interesting behind the scenes video so if you haven't seen yeah. it you should definitely watch it Right, and then uh, the, the other highlights or the, the most relevant aspects of my channel so far are basically I have a lot of coverage on my GT Omega Pro sim rig that you see right behind me here, um, and maybe the most recent video that I have on that I that is about a piece that I personally like a lot and that that was way too expensive is my genuine Porsche 901.2 wheel rim here um, that I got off of an uh, of a regular Porsche dealership here in town. Um, which is, I think, also some something that um, may, maybe sim racers don't often think about. That yeah, you, you can actually just buy real race car gear and put it in your rig, just like the seat. Um, and yeah, so maybe that's interesting also for some of yeah, you. Yeah, again, uh, very cool video and uh, just a very cool thing. I'm a little bit jealous, it has to be said. So I yeah. think, <laughs> I think we have actually covered all of the talking points, which is a minor miracle because I think this has probably run on for about an hour now. <laughs> Not bad for a twenty-minute yeah. video, eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you're gonna have to uh, some some cutting to do in the end. I, guess. <laughs> yeah. I, I I think I'll leave it all in. To be honest, man, I think uh, okay, okay. everything was really interesting. Uh, thank you for joining me, Leon. It's been, well, personally speaking, it's been really fascinating, really interesting to be able to see behind the scenes a little bit about how you might go about approaching creating a track for Assetto Corsa. Obviously, we talked about quite a lot of stuff otherwise. But uh, yeah, thank you very much for joining me, man. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you very much for having me. And to all of you viewers, have a good day. Bye bye. <laughs> So I hope you guys found that interesting. Personally, I thought it was really fascinating to learn some of the stuff that goes into making a mod for Assetto Corsa. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, it would be great if you could hit the like button and subscribe to the channel so you can see more content like this in the future. So all that's left to say is goodbye, thank you for watching, and enjoy the rest of your day.